Welcome to Road Ride, guys. I'm Let's Fly RC, and today we're gonna show you how to build Baby Shark. Baby Shark is a lightweight FPV frame that's great for indoor and outdoor flying. The best thing about it is that it's HD. When I designed Baby Shark and I flew around in my house, I had a whole new love for flying micros again. And I think you guys will enjoy it yourself. The parts we're gonna to use today are a carbon fiber reinforcement plate, a TPU pod, a plastic frame, four dab motors, an FR Sky receiver, beta FPV flight controller and ESC stack, the Runcam Nano HD. We'll be using the Shark Bite digital FPV VTX, a lollipop UFL antenna, special screws, straps, zip ties. We got all the tools ready to go. Let's get started. Don't lose that guy. That's a very important piece. This is a battery pad that keeps the battery from sliding around. The screws that come with the motors are just a little bit too long. So we've got special screws to fit this frame that are exactly five millimeters long. You definitely wanna use these screws and not the ones that come with the motors. Shiny motors. All right, so the first step would be to get the flight controller mounted to the body and the motors soldered to the flight controllers. One way would be to direct solder to the board, which means you'd have to take off these connectors. And that's the way I'm gonna be doing it today. The second way to do it would be to buy the crimping tool and the proper crimping connectors to put onto this to plug it into the actual flight controller. The way I'm gonna be doing it today is I'm gonna be taking off these connectors and direct soldering to the board. It's a more permanent connection and less subject to getting broken or falling off in flight. Future Sean here. So it turns out that the soldering you're about to see in this video is really hard to do, even for me. So we came up with a better solution. In case you don't have insanely great soldering skills, this is way easier to do. So originally I decided to snip off the connectors on the beta board that we were using for these builds. And that not only voids the warranty, but also makes it very difficult to solder to the board. It's very tiny, tiny solder joints. It's really hard to do even for me. So one of the things that I decided to do was to order some of these JST SH pigtails. And these are designed to plug right into the board. And we can use these pigtails with our pipe train dab motors. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to chop off the leads, solder them to the right length, and then we can just plug it right into the board. It's gonna make the build process so much simpler, so much easier. There was actually three different methods that I used when I built these. One of them was to solder directly to the board. One of them was to try to crimp my own connections in these little connectors. And this way we're going to actually snip off the leads from the motor and reattach this pigtail to the motor. I think this is gonna be the easiest method for people to be successful with. So I'm just stripping off about four millimeters worth of wire and that is going to be soldered to this pigtail. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tin these three pieces of wire. I'm gonna go ahead and tin the wires that are already factory tinned because they use lead free solder over in China. We're gonna go ahead and retin these with our leaded rosin coarse solder because it just joins a lot easier to our leaded solder we're gonna be using for this connector here as well. So before we do that, we actually need to take a piece of heat shrink for each wire and run it up the wire so that we don't forget. So let's just go ahead and put our heat shrink on the wire right now. So we're gonna put a little small piece of heat shrink on each of these three wires. All right, so I'm using 6040 leaded rosin core solder for this. Works really well, it's very easy to use. And you can get a really nice, clean, strong solder joint with this solder. So try to find either 6040 or 3763 solder with the rosin core and leaded for this project. And if you're only doing a small amount of builds, then the lead is not really gonna be an issue on your health. We're just doing one quadcopter here, shouldn't be a problem. I'm gonna tin these three connections and just join them together. I wanna make sure I hold the heat shrink away so it doesn't get heated up and melted right away. Go ahead and touch these. If your, if your solder joint doesn't look the best, you can just desolder it retin the two leads and try again and get it looking really nice and clean before you put it all together. All right, so now that we've got our three wires soldered, we can go ahead and slide the heat shrink down and heat it up. Make sure that it lines up properly with the solder joint that you created. And once you have your heat shrink centered on the solder joint that you created, you can go ahead and hit it with a heat gun or a lighter or something similar. So all you have to do is repeat this process three more times and you'll be ready to mount these motors to the frame and to plug these right into the flight control board. And we won't have to worry about soldering to the board. It's gonna be so much easier to do and it's gonna make the build so much faster for you guys. So once you have your motors pigtailed up, all we're gonna do is slide the pigtail right through the slot here. 
go ahead and put our motor into its position. And then once we have that in position, we can flip the board over and we can plug it in to its port. This one's gonna go right into this port here. And that was so much easier than trying to solder to the board. And I can just tuck the excess wire right up inside the frame there. Because all you have to do is plug these guys in and you won't have to do all that crazy soldering that you're about to see from old Sean. <laughs> Let's get back to the build video. All right, so we're gonna take the gummies out of the bag. The Beta FPV flight controller comes with all the screws, gummies, and wiring that you're gonna need for this build. Try not to lose any of them. They give you a couple of extras, but we might need every piece to build this. These gummies get installed into the flight control board, and this is very fragile. So you have to be extremely careful when putting these gummies into this flight control board that you don't break off the outer tip. The first one I built, I broke the outer tip off of one of them because I wasn't being careful enough. So you just have to kind of get it in there. Kind of a pain in the butt to do. I like to use the 1.5 mil hex tool when I'm putting these in because it's not sharp, it's a little blunt, and it helps to push the gummy in. Like I said, you have to be very careful not to break the circuit board when you're doing it. It's not the end of the world if you do, it's just a little bit more durable and holds itself in place better if you don't break it. We're gonna repeat the same process for the other three holes. Be careful not to rip the gummies. They give you an extra one just in case. The easiest way I've found to direct solder these is to cut these plastic connectors off. If you're very careful and you take a set of cutters like this and you just kind of get underneath the plastic, wiggle it back and forth a little bit as you're squeezing, you can get the little plastic connector to come right off. And you want to do that three more times to get all of the plastic connectors off. You don't want to take off any of these little circuits off of the board. You got to be really careful not to damage anything when you're doing it. But if you're just a little bit careful, you can just kind of lift them off. The easiest way to remove these pins is to attach a heavy tool like a hemostat to them. You want to lock onto one of these at a time and then solder from the other side so that gravity will make it fall to the ground. So now that I have the hemostat attached, I'm going to take the soldering iron with a tiny bit of solder on there and just add some heat to that pad, wiggle it back and forth a little bit until the pin falls out. Okay, so I'm just going to add a little bit of fresh solder, wiggle it back and forth, and it falls right out. So now we've got to do that 11 more times. <laughs> All right, so that's hemostat number two. Add a little bit of solder to the tip and just touch the one pad, wiggle back and forth, and it falls right out. You need to be very careful with these pads because if you apply too much heat or touch them for too long of a period of time, they will come right off the board. So as you're doing this, as you're trying to clean them up, just be very careful not to touch them for too long or apply too much heat to them. So make sure your soldering iron isn't set too hot. I made sure that I put some fresh solder on them and I separated them from each other so that the solder is not touching one pad to the next. When doing this, you wanna use like pretty much the smallest soldering iron tip that you have available. It's a very tedious build. Little micros are always the hardest. A good way to remove a little bit of extra solder if there's too much on there is to just keep cleaning the tip of your soldering iron and bringing it back and it has a tendency to collect the solder for you. When you're finished, you wanna make sure that all six pads on both sides are not touching each other on both sides of the board. You wanna make sure that none of the pads are touching each other and there's plenty of gap in between each pad. All 12 pins have been removed now. I'm just gonna apply a little bit of fresh solder to them so that they are shiny and we try to we're gonna to try to flood them with a little bit of extra solder to remove all of the solder from the manufacturer and replace it with solder with the built-in flux. I'm using Hester rosin-based solder with built-in flux. Right now we're using 6040 solder. I typically use 7337 solder. Uh, either one works fine as long as it's got the rosin core with the built-in flux. You wanna get your solder to look beautiful like that. Nice and shiny little ball of solder left on the pad, and that's perfect for attaching the new motor. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and mount all four of the motors to the frame, and then I'm gonna put the flight controller in position. This slot right here is made for an LED license plate, so that's how you know where the rear of the frame is. If you keep that in mind throughout the rest of the build, it'll make it easier to remember where everything goes. So this is the front, that's the back. We're gonna go ahead and just start putting the motors in. So as I'm putting the motors in, I'm gonna take this carbon fiber plate and place it on the bottom, put the screws through the carbon fiber plate, through the plastic, and into the motor. To get the exact right screw size, we've included these five millimeter 
M2 screws, which are exactly the right length to go through the carbon, the plastic, into the motor without affecting the windings. Whenever you're installing a motor, you need to make sure that the screw doesn't protrude past the metal and into the windings of the motor, or you could damage a motor by going into the wire windings of the motor. This one has serial number 00010. They're actually serial numbered and everything. We're putting in number 10. Using a 1.5 millimeter Rotor Riot hex tool to put the screws in. When putting these screws in, it's always a good idea to use a little bit of Loctite just to keep them from falling back out in the future. There's a lot of vibration that goes on in these little drones and the vibration tends to back out these screws. And if you lose these screws, you're probably not gonna find them again. Depending on the tolerance of the carbon, it might be a little tight and you may have to use a little bit of screwing force to get it through the carbon fiber panel. So don't tighten the first screw all the way down right away. Leave the first screw a little bit loose and then put in all four screws in each motor just a little bit loose before you completely tighten them down. That makes it easier to line the other holes up. Just a little bit snug, but not completely tight. Leave a little bit of a gap there until you get all four screws in. And then once you get all four screws in, you can tighten it down all the way. Don't go crazy. Don't need that much force. I'm gonna tighten them in a crisscross pattern, going back and forth in this crisscross pattern as I tighten them and just kind of make sure they're all snug. There's not a special torque spec, but tighten it down until right before you think you're gonna rip the threads out <laughs> and stop. I'm just gonna route this wire down and towards the left and right sides of the frame. So all of these motor wires are going to either be on the left side or the right side of the frame, not the front or the back. So get the back here, we got the back here, got the front here. We're gonna route these wires up and through the side of the frame like this. And we're gonna repeat this process three more times. All right, so the next step in this process is to solder the motors to the flight controller. We've got the wires routed to the sides. Remember, this is the back and this is the front of the frame. So the wires are routed to the side and up through this center cavity here on either side, left and right. We pretty much wanna keep all the wires the same length. We're just gonna kind of tuck them under the flight controller when we're done. If you cut them any shorter, it's gonna be really hard to solder this board. I'm actually gonna be using this helping hands setup here to hold the frame in an orientation that makes it easier for me to solder to the board. The way the board gets mounted, the cable here gets routed through the back hole of the cavity. So this is the back of the quad and the cable's gonna end up going through this hole and it lines up just like that on the board. These four gummies are gonna line up to these four holes that are sticking up, and we're not gonna press it down right now, but that's how it's gonna end up being when we're done. This little tiny arrow right here is pointing forward, and that is the orientation we want the board to end up in when we're finished. As you can see, the motor pads are off to the side here on both sides, so that's why we ran the wires up the side here on the left and the right, because we're gonna be attaching it to the bottom of the board. All right, so the trickiest part about this is trying to keep track of which wire goes where. As far as the three wires on the motor goes, it doesn't necessarily matter which one you attach it to because in the in BL Heli in the future, we're gonna be able to reverse the motor direction through software. So getting the three motor wires exactly in position, middle, left, right, isn't that important, uh, but it is important that you get motor one attached to motor one on the board, motor two attached to motor two on the board. Just basically line them up with the position that they're sitting on the board. This is gonna be motor one, this is gonna be motor two, this is gonna be motor three, and this will be motor four. So you just wanna make sure you attach the motors to the proper pads. We're gonna attach these wires to the bottom of the flight control board rather than the top, because there's, there's not a whole lot of room to get the wires up and over to the top. I mean, I guess you could, but when you put all these wires in there and you put the pod on top, it gets a little bit tight and congested. Right, so I'm gonna get the helping hand set up to position this flight controller in this orientation so that I can attach all the wires I need to the board. Just hold them like that. Take this guy, hold my flight control board, and I don't wanna cover my solder points. There we go. All right, now I've got it lined up. I'm gonna take my rotor riot tweezers and I'm gonna attach these wires to their solder points. But before I do that, I wanna trim off about half of the metal that's already pre-tinned from the factory because you want to have a very, very small amount of wire left over on the end 
before you solder it to the pad. We want them to be as short as possible so that they don't end up touching each other because they are so close together. The whole point of this build is to keep it as light as possible. We have another whoop style frame that uses the DJI setup and the DJI setup is so heavy that it's not as nimble and free flowing as this frame. This frame flies so much better because of its lightweight. So in order to keep it light, we did a lot of extra stuff to keep it light. Using the shark bite system was key in keeping this frame super light because the shark bite system is the size of a tiny whoop board. Super lightweight. Tin up all these wires that I've already cut them just a little bit short. Tin them all up. You want to pre-tin all these wires to try to get some of that factory lead-free solder off of them and put some of the leaded rosin core solder on. If you tin your wires and tin your pads, they'll go together really easily. If you don't pre-tin them, then you're going to have a little bit of a trouble trying to get the solder joints to look good when you're done. You can tell, this, you can see all the bubbles. That's all the, that's all the uh, rosin core flux that's in this. This solder has a ton of flux in it, which is, makes it really easy to solder with but it's a little bit messy at the same time. I like to try to start with the one that's hardest to get to first, like the center ones first, and then move my way out to the outer edges. This is really hard to do. There we go. One down, 11 to go. <laughs> Ideally, you want to use an even smaller soldering tip than what I'm using, because this one's kind of big. Just got to inspect it really good. Make sure that nothing is touching, and it looks good. Everything looks good on those three. So, move on to the next three. It'd be pretty much impossible without these tweezers. All right, we're halfway there. This is the hardest part. Everything else in this build is pretty much easy, but this is the hardest part of the whole build, is soldering these guys on. You wanna make sure that you have the right three wires going to the right quadrant on the board. See, you don't wanna do what I did, because I've got one wire from this motor going to this quadrant, two wires from this motor going to that quadrant, and yeah, so I gotta now move around a couple wires. Make sure you're paying attention to which motor is hooked to which quadrant when you're doing it. I have to go back and do more work. Let's try not to mess up this time. So that I don't get them mixed up, I'm gonna take the three wires from each side and just kind of bend them over the plastic frame just so that they're tucked out of the way. And that way when I'm working on this one, I only have these three wires exposed and that'll keep me from screwing up. Oh yeah, that was the right angle right there. If you mess up on your joint, it's always a good idea to go back and retin both connectors with fresh solder because the flux gets used up. And then if you try it a second time, it's really hard to get the two to bond together without the flux. Boom, see how nice and clean that went. All right, we got all 12 wires attached. I'm just inspecting them to make sure that none of the wires are touching each other and that they all kind of have an upward direction to them because when we flip this over, we want them to all point down. So now that I've got all the wires in the right position, I'm gonna flip the board over and push it back down onto the board. But before, the, before I actually push it down onto the board, I wanna go ahead and prepare the receiver which is gonna get mounted underneath this board. I'm bending these wires so that they are kind of straight. Be very careful not to bend them too hard because you might break the solder pad off the board, but we do want them to be kind of straight so that they're facing downward because we need to push them down into the frame and they need to be pointing in a downward direction. I'm just gonna pull the wiring down through as I push this board in. Make sure my XD60 is going through the right place. And I'm just test fitting right now to make sure that everything is gonna fit properly before I install the receiver. Okay, yeah, it's fine. I don't have to do any other adjustments. So I'm just gonna line up these gummies to their holes and see if I can press it down into position, and I can. So that means that I did a good job on all the wiring. When I'm done, I'll just take all this excess wiring and tuck it inside the hole there, and it's gonna have its own little place in there. It'll be totally fine. There's no need to worry about the excess wire. The excess wire will give you the ability to service this in the future if you ever need to open it up for any reason. Not having that excess wire there is gonna make it impossible to pull the board up if you ever had to get to the underside of that board. So right now I'm just gonna go ahead and pop the board back up and I'm going to install the receiver where it needs to be underneath the board before I snap it down into place. The Beta FPV board comes with two plugs. It comes with a four pin plug for the receiver and a six pin plug that's normally used for the DJI receiver, but we're gonna end up using this for our SharkBite system instead. So this six pin connector will be used for the SharkBite system. This four pin connector will be used for our receiver. 
And the receiver we're using today is the RXSR from FR Sky. We're gonna wanna connect the cable that came with the RXSR to the connector that came with the Beta FPV flight controller. Now you could just take these two connectors and solder and heat shrink them together, but that's a little bit messy. So I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than that. I'm actually gonna cut this connector off and solder directly to the board with the Beta FPV cable that came with the Beta FPV flight controller. We're only gonna need three of these wires. We're gonna need five volts, ground, and the S-Bus wire. The fourth wire we're just gonna take off. On this particular cable, we're going to use red, black, and white, and we're gonna take off the yellow lead. We don't need that lead. We only need power, ground, and receive. The easiest way to remove these pins is to take a razor blade and lift up on the white tab and pull out the wire. So I got the tab lifted up, pull the wire out. You can also use an XM Plus with this as well. On some of the other builds, I used an XM Plus receiver instead of the RXSR receiver. You could probably even use a Spectrum receiver in here just fine, and you would wire it a little bit differently. But you're still gonna use the three wires, power, ground, and receive. We're gonna take this white connector off in a similar fashion to what we did on the other board, but I'm gonna be a little bit more destructive with this one and just kinda cut it off of there because these pins don't come, this white connector doesn't come off as easy as it did on the flight controller. So I'm just gonna be a little destructive and taking these pins off of there without damaging the board. If you have some nice angled cutters like this, it makes it pretty easy to take them off. I'm gonna keep all three of these wires the same length that they came with the Beta FPV board and just tin them up and prepare them to connect to the receiver. So we need voltage ground and S-Bus out on this receiver. The outermost pin is ground, the second pin in is five volts, and the fourth pin in is the S-Bus out. We wanna use those three connections when hooking to the RXSR. All right, so this is the outermost pad right here. I'm just put a little solder on these. These are kinda of tiny too, a little bit hard to work with, just like the flight control board. Just gonna kinda of add some solder to them and tin them up. We need to get all that lead-free solder off the pads so that we can kinda of flood it with the leaded solder that we have because it works a little better. You can see all that flux on there. I'm adding leaded solder to this board because the lead-free solder that comes from the manufacturer doesn't solder well. And I just kinda of flooded them with a little bit too much solder and then wiped off the excess so that I can have a nice shiny connection. And if you really wanna make it nice, you can clean it with alcohol and get all that ugly yellow flux off of there before you continue, because it's hard to see. But I actually have all five pads cleaned up at this point. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and attach ground to the outermost pad. Actually, I'm gonna do red first because the outermost pad is one of the easiest ones to solder to. This one's a little harder to line up. There we go, got my power. Gonna get my ground. And then the fourth pin in is gonna be our S-Bus pad. So this white wire is gonna go to the fourth pad in. All right, we got our three wires connected to the receiver. I'm gonna add some heat shrink to the receiver to keep everything protected. And then we can plug it into the board and close everything up. Ideally, you wanna take some alcohol and a paintbrush and just kinda clean off the excess flux that's left over when you're done. I'm using some solder that has a ton of flux in it and it just makes a mess. It's not really gonna hurt anything, but it just doesn't look clean. All right, so I'm gonna trim my heat shrink down to about the right size. I don't need quite that much heat shrink. Okay. I'm gonna put this on there, heat shrink it up. We need to use clear heat shrink on these because you have to be able to access the bind button. It's really small. Heat shrink's like almost not small enough. <laughs> All right, so now that we've got this connector attached to our RXSR receiver. This is the bind button. We're gonna make sure that this bind button is accessible for when we have to bind up our receiver in the future. So we're gonna go ahead and insert this into the frame and this four pin connector, this plug plugs in right there on the Beta FPV flight controller. It's a little bit challenging to get in there with this gummy in the way and you definitely wanna do it before you put the screw in. If you're really careful, you can strategically squeeze it in there and keep the gummy from getting crushed by it. But it takes a little bit of effort. I usually squeeze the gummy out of the way. I get my finger in there just right and I pull the connector out of the way. There we go. And now the gummy is outside of that port. Kind of pull the wires up and out of the way because we're gonna have to put a screw 
into this gummy in the future. So make sure that connector is pushed all the way in and that these wires are just kind of pulled up and out of the way. So that when we put the screw in later, they won't be in the way. I'm gonna route this cable down beside the flight control board and underneath the frame. I wanna position it to where the antennas come out the front of the frame and wrap around the ducts. So this is the front of the frame and I want my wires to come out that direction, like that. Let's slide this down, get the wires coming out the front like that, and I'm gonna flip it over to where the bind button is facing the bottom of the drone, so that we can access it in the future when we go to bind this up. I'm gonna push it back far enough towards the rear of the drone that the bind button sticks out just a little bit. It doesn't need to be mounted in there, it can just kind of be hanging free but I'm gonna push it back just enough to where on the back side, you're able to pull it out just enough to access the bind button right there. So that's about the position that I want this to be sitting in. When I tape these wires to the body itself, I want this to be accessible. I, I need enough length on the wire for that to happen. Then I can push it back in when I'm done. So now once we have this where we want it to be, I'm gonna take some electrical tape and I'm gonna tape these wires from the receiver in this orientation around the outside of the frame. All right, so I'm gonna take a little bit of electrical tape. Just about one inch pieces should be sufficient. Make sure my receiver's where I want it. Stick the electrical tape around the frame. Here we go. I'm just gonna kind of wrap the antenna in the electrical tape around the frame like this. I'm trying to keep it as tight as possible as I'm wrapping the tape so that the inside of the tape doesn't have anything sticking out for the prop to strike. I'm gonna put three more pieces, one piece here, one piece there, and one piece there, just to keep the antennas from getting chopped up by the props. I know it's kind of silly to be picky about electrical tape, but the electrical tape I like to use is the 3M Super 33 Plus. This is the best electrical tape to use for this because it's extremely sticky and it's very flexible. It's easy, it's stretchy, uh, other electrical tapes will probably let go because the glue that they use just isn't good enough to hold on for long periods of time. So if you're gonna get picky about electrical tape, the best electrical tape to use is the 3M Super 33. I got this at Home Depot. But as I'm putting it on, I'm stretching the tape as I'm pulling it around, and that keeps the glue nice and tight so that it doesn't unravel when I'm flying and take out my props. <laughs> All right, so, so far we got the receiver mounted in there. I've got enough slack to where I can pull it back and access the bind button out the back side so I can bind up in the future. And it just kind of tucks its way underneath there. I've got my cables routed around the side of the flight controller here. All right, so I got all the wires in place. I got the receiver mounted. I'm gonna go ahead and push the flight controller down into position. All right, so you just wanna push these gummies down over those four plastic posts. And we're gonna put the four screws into those posts to hold the flight controller down. On the bottom side, I'm just gonna take these wires and tuck them in to the hole underneath the frame so that none of the wires will get struck by the propellers. And everything just fits in there just perfectly, enough room for everything to be there. There's also enough room for the battery strap as well when we're finished with the build. All right, so we're gonna flip it back over and put the four screws in. Now the Beta FPV flight controller came with all of these screws and we're gonna use almost all of them for this build. There are long screws and short screws. For the flight controller, we want to find the five short screws. We're only gonna use four of them, but there's five long screws and five short screws that come with the Beta FPV flight controller. We want the four short screws to mount the flight controller. It really helps if you have a magnetic screwdriver to do this because they're so small that they're hard to put on. And you can magnetize your Phillips head screwdriver just by touching it to a magnet. So this is the hardest one to do, so we'll do it first. We gotta put the screw in without letting the screw damage the wire on the way down. So keep a very close eye on the power wires as you screw in this screw. Make sure that it doesn't damage the coating on the wire or the wire itself. And then the other three screws are fairly simple to put on. <sighs> the hard part's done. The rest of it's fairly easy. So this is a SharkBite HD video transmitter, and that's the next step in this build. We're going to take the six pin connector that came with the Beta FPV flight controller and we're gonna install that. We're gonna attach four of the wires to these four pads on the SharkBite video transmitter. On this video transmitter, we've got ground, power, receive, and transmit. And we wanna hook 
four of the wires from the six pin connector that came with the Beta FPV flight controller to these four pads. From this six pin harness, we're going to use the first four pins, red, black, yellow, and white. We're gonna position them on this board as black, red, yellow, white in that order. And we're gonna take off the remaining two wires at the end of this harness, because we're not gonna use those. We're gonna go back to our little trusty razor blade here. We're gonna lift up the two white tabs on the outer edge of this connector, and we're gonna remove the yellow and the black. So we remove the yellow and the black. We're left with red, black, yellow, and white. So we're gonna keep all this length just how it is. And we're gonna tin these four ends and we're gonna tin these four pads on the video transmitter and we're gonna connect it up. So the hardest one to get to is the one closest to the Molex plate. So I'm gonna do the white one first. Then I'm gonna do the yellow one and so on and so forth. So we got yellow, all right, red, and black. There we go, all right. Cool, so we're gonna take this video transmitter and we're gonna simply just plug it into this port right here. Make sure it goes all the way in, seated properly. This video transmitter needs an antenna and the antenna that we're gonna end up using on this build is the Lollipop Micro with a UFL connector on it because it's really small and lightweight and it fits the build really well. The camera and cable come together with the SharkBite system and the camera and the cable need to be hooked to this video transmitter also prior to putting it all together because there are two holes in this video transmitter right here and here that are designed to have a zip tie in place to keep the antenna and the camera cable in place so that they don't pop loose and come disconnected in flight. So we're gonna put those all together. All right, so we need to take this camera cable and orient it like this and line it up with the connections on the video transmitter, get it kind of lined up, feel it out, and just press it in place. And it snaps right in place. We're gonna do the same thing with the UFL connector of the antenna. Just kind of line it up and snap it in place in this orientation here. And now we can take a little tiny zip tie and go between those two holes and lock them in place. So the way you wanna do it is you wanna put the zip tie in in this direction so that the big fat head of the zip tie is on top because there's not enough room between two boards for this zip tie to have the fat head on the bottom. It's a little tight. You might be able to find yourself a skinnier zip tie than what I found. Push it through the other side. Watch out for the cable. All right, pull it tight. Don't damage anything in the process. But you wanna to try to get rid of this bump as much as possible on the bottom side. And then we're just gonna lock the zip tie in place. And that'll just make sure the antenna doesn't come unplugged and the camera cable doesn't come unplugged in flight. The smaller the zip tie, the better. It doesn't have to be a strong, fat zip tie. It's a very light build. Okay, there you go and take some right angle cutters and chop off the end. Next, we're gonna mount the camera inside the TPU pod and then we'll be mounting the video transmitter inside the TPU pod. Before we mount the camera, we kind of have to get the direction of the camera figured out. So we need to put the connector on the camera in the proper orientation. This only fits one direction. If you try to put it on backwards, it's not gonna snap in place. This is the orientation that you need to put the camera cable on. Just line it up like before, push it in with your thumb until it clicks in place. You want the camera to be oriented in where the wires are facing the sky and then your camera will be facing the proper position in the right direction when you put it in the pod. When we put it in the pod, we're gonna put it in this direction. We're going to use the two holes in the back because it's going to give the camera a little bit of extra protection. If you want to be able to have a little bit more tilt angle to the camera, then you can move the camera to the two front holes, but there should be plenty of, this is finicky, there should be plenty of angle available using the back holes for almost any situation. So we're going to just kind of line it up to the two holes. Those are the screws that came with the RunCam camera. We're gonna use the two longest screws that came with it to mount the camera in place. They're just barely long enough to reach the camera with a little bit of pressure. Try to line it up to the camera's hole as you're putting it in, just like that. All right, put our second screw in. Screw my screw in until it's tight. Don't get it too tight. What you wanna first do before you get it super tight is adjust your camera angle. Now me personally, I like the camera angle all the way down because most of the time when I'm flying this, I'm flying indoors and I don't need to go super fast. But some of you racers out there might wanna have a little bit more camera angle and you've got tons of camera angle to work with with this pod. One of the reasons I built this pod with such a high angle is that all of this extra space up here provides a ton of protection 
to protect the camera in case you do land upside down. One of the major problems I had with some of the original micro drones like this is that I would land upside down on the pod and break the pod or break the camera or break the flight controller. This has all this extra room up here of bumper to protect on a top impact and keep it safe and durable. Woo! All right, so we're gonna use the remaining screws that came with the Beta FPV flight controller to screw the VTX to the pod now. We need three of the long screws that came with the Beta FPV flight controller to mount this VTX into the pod. There are three mounting posts, one, two, three, that we're gonna mount to. These three cylinders, one, two, three cylinders, are where we're going to be mounting the video transmitter. There are little tiny holes in the TPU pod just big enough for the screw to penetrate through. All right, so when we put this video transmitter in, we're gonna put it in a position where the antenna is gonna pop out the back. So we're just gonna take the antenna and push it through the section in the back of the TPU pod for the antenna to come out of. And yeah, we're gonna line up the video transmitter in this orientation right here. The wires are just going to get pressed along the side of this. We're gonna kind of push on the wires a little bit not, don't press too hard because we don't want to damage the coating on the wire, but we're going to push down the wires just a little bit so that it can rest up against the TPU side of this panel. And as we put it in, just be very, very careful of the wires not to damage them, and be very careful that you don't pop these little tabs off because these little tabs are very fragile, and if you're not careful, you can pop these little tabs off. These tabs are going to help us to keep this locked in place properly. So when you're putting it in, just be very careful not to let these tabs get snapped off. All right, so I'm just kind of slowly pushing it down and push it down until it pushes up against those three bumpers. All right, so we're gonna take these three screws and we're gonna put them in to their positions. Just kind of screw them into the TPU until they bite and lock the video transmitter in place. And repeat that two more times. We're not gonna do the screw in the front of the TPU pod. The one that's closest to the camera, we're not going to put a screw in because there's no cylinder tab thingy in that position. All right, so we got one, two, three screws. We don't have a screw on the front where the camera is. Now we're gonna mount the TPU pod to the frame. Remember, this is the rear of the quad and this is the front. So we will just lay this in place, making sure that all the wires lay down properly underneath this TPU pod. We're gonna try to line up our four holes and put our screws in. We have three remaining screws that came with the Beta FPV flight controller. We're gonna take the two long screws and place them on the left and the right of the pod. And we're gonna take the fourth screw and put it into the back of the pod. The front of the frame has a slightly larger hole. We're gonna use the one remaining long screw that came with our camera to mount the front of the pod. All right, so get the screw all the way through, line it up to the hole, screw it down. Don't over tighten it because you don't want to strip out the plastic. Okay. Now the last one's a little bit more difficult. You definitely want to have a magnetic screwdriver for this because you're going to have to put it down inside of this long cylinder hole and try to line it up with the center as you're going down. This screw is not necessary if you have trouble with it. It's just an extra screw that I put in place just for a little bit of extra strength. But the original frame design wasn't even using this screw. Yeah, look at that, it's nice and tight. That one's locked in place, these two are locked in place, and we got one left in the front. Like I said, this one's just a little bit bigger of a hole on the frame, so we're gonna use an M2 screw to go down into the front. And this is now one of the most durable micros that exists. So now we got this antenna left over, we're going to lay it into the channel that's set right there. This is designed to have a zip tie come through here and lock it in place so that the antenna doesn't get yanked off. So we're just gonna wrap our zip tie around the antenna through the little hole in the back there and lock it in place. Okay, cut that guy off. Now the antenna ain't going nowhere. All right, so this guy is all ready to go except for putting props on and flashing the software to the board. So what we're gonna first do is go into Betaflight and make sure that all our settings are correct for the receiver, for the video transmitter, and make sure the motors are spinning the proper direction. We're gonna plug into the USB port on the very bottom. This is a USB mini, I think. We're gonna plug in our cable to the bottom. Right now we don't necessarily need a battery connected until we're ready to spin up the motors. For right now we're gonna set the basic features up of the flight control board. When we first connect, it's gonna tell you the accelerometer is not calibrated. 
and we need to close that screen. All right, let's put this up on a table here. This is our new accelerometer calibration tool. We're gonna plug in our USB port, and in order to calibrate the accelerometer, we need to have it on a flat and level surface. It's kind of hard to get a flat and level surface with a big USB sticking out the bottom. So we're gonna improvise, and we're gonna use this cinder block as our flat and level surface. So we're gonna go ahead and connect to Betaflight, close the warning screen, and click Calibrate Accelerometer. That's the first thing we wanna do. Now we're calibrated, we can do away with the cinder block. <laughs> All right, the first tab we're gonna go to is the Ports tab. And in the Ports tab, we wanna make sure that UART3 is set to Serial RX. We wanna make sure that UART4 is connected to MSP. That's going to allow the OSD information and stick commands to operate the SharkBite system. Save and reboot, and then we'll move on to the next tab. So we're gonna reconnect again, go into the configuration tab. That's the next tab we're gonna go to. Make sure DSHOT 600 is selected. Um, I usually drop the motor idle percent value to two or somewhere in that range because it's a little bit too floaty with the standard idle value. I usually go and change the maximum R angle degrees to 180. That will allow you to arm it at any angle in case you get stuck somewhere. Make sure it's set to S bus and make sure that your RX set is enabled if you want to be able to enable the beeper mode. It's also good to enable RX loss in case you turn off your transmitter. The, the, the model will start beeping if you enable RX loss if you turn off your transmitter. So save and reboot and reconnect. On the battery tab, I like to increase the maximum cell voltage to 4.5 and that keeps it from giving me warnings when it doesn't need to give me battery warnings. Sometimes when you plug in a LiPo, if it's a little bit over or a little bit under, it'll give you warnings that you have the wrong LiPo plugged in and that stops that from happening. On PID tuning tab, we're not gonna leave, we're not gonna change any of that stuff. I like to use my RSSI channel as AUX4 and then I can get RSSI value from my transmitter to the OSD on AUX4, which is actually channel eight, and then save that. On the modes tab, we need to make sure we enable arming on AUX1 is the way I have my transmitter set up. You can also enable beeper, turtle mode, and any other features you want in the modes tab. I'm gonna go ahead and set up the beeper on AUX3, because that's the way my transmitter's set up. I'm gonna set up flip over after crash on AUX2, and that's pretty much all the features that I need set on mine. In the OSD tab, you definitely wanna have battery voltage selected at the very minimum, so that way you can see what your LiPo's at. Move the battery down to the bottom so it's out of the way. Save, you can enable any other things you want on the OSD, but that's all I'm gonna have on mine. That and the RSSI, actually. I'm gonna have the RSSI as well, so that I can see what the signal strength is of the receiver. The next thing I need to check on is to make sure that the motors are in the right position, because the board orientation might have them in the wrong position. So I'm gonna spin up each motor one at a time. And right now, this is what Betaflight thinks motor one is. That's not the right motor for number one, motor one. Motor one should be over here. Motor two is spinning this motor. So one and two are actually reversed. This should be motor three, but that is actually motor three. This should be motor four, but that's motor four. So we need to flip-flop motors one and two, and we need to flip-flop motors three and four in Betaflight. In order to do that, we're gonna to need to go to CLI. In the CLI tab, we're gonna type in resource. We're gonna find the resource for motors one through four, and we're gonna copy the information into a text editing program, such as text edit, and paste it into that. So I wanna change a few values. We need to flip-flop three and four, and we need to flip-flop one and two. So we're gonna do that really quick on the text editor, and we're gonna recopy and repaste this back into Betaflight. So now I'm gonna paste those commands back into Betaflight, hit enter, Hit save, and now our motor should be in the correct orientation. Let's reconnect to Betaflight and verify on the motors tab that the motors are going, and the motors are in the right position. So this is one, that's correct now. This should be two, that's correct now. This should be three, and this should be four. And that's correct. So now we need to make sure that the motors are spinning the right direction. You definitely don't want to do this with the props on, so we're gonna go ahead and test the prop direction with the props off. We're gonna go ahead and plug in the battery and it didn't catch on fire, so we did something right. All right, in the motors tab of Betaflight, we're going to 
spin up all the motors and see what direction they're spinning. We're not going to spin them all the way up, just a little bit is enough to figure out what direction they're spinning. And you can kind of feel them, make sure all four motors are working, and make sure they're all going in the right direction. Now on this model, I've got three motors spinning the wrong direction and one motor, sp motor spinning the right direction. Motor one is spinning the correct direction, which is the swimming configuration or props out. So these three motors are all incorrect and they need to be changed in BL Heli. So we're gonna disconnect from beta flight and we're going to use BL Heli Suite to fix the motor direction. So I'm gonna use the Chrome configurator just because it's easier to do that on a Mac. In the BL Heli configurator, we're gonna click connect and we're gonna read the setup and we're going to leave everything the way it is because there's no reason to change it. We're gonna change all the motor directions that we need to fix ESC1 was correct, ESC2 needed to go to reverse, ESC3 needs to go to reverse, and ESC4 needs to go to reverse. We're going to write setup, and now all the motors should be spinning the correct direction. So we're going to disconnect from BL Heli and go back to Betaflight and make sure that our motors are all spinning the correct direction now. Back in Betaflight, we're going to go to the Motors tab, and we're going to enable the motors and try one more time to make sure they're all spinning the right direction. And now they're all spinning the right direction. And the one last thing we need to do in Betaflight is go to the Configuration tab and make sure that the motor direction is reversed, and it already is, so that's good. We can save and reboot everything, and we're ready to put the props on and give it a test flight. If you don't want to have to go through all these steps, we will have a tune file ready for you. Link in the description. Check it out. You will still have to make sure motor direction is correct, but all the other steps that I performed in beta flight, you won't have to do. We've got a nice tune file that has the proper PID tuning and everything for this particular build. It actually has a tune file for 2S and 3S. So when you plug in a 2S battery, it'll automatically have the right settings. When you plug in a 3S battery, it'll automatically have the right settings for 3S. So now we're gonna disconnect all the cables, connect the props, and take it for a test flight. Make sure you put the props facing out, laces out. So Baby Shark takes a two inch prop. Just about any two inch prop should work just fine. We're using the HQ 2x2x3 two by two by prop here. Now before we can fly this, we have to bind it to the receiver. And I am using a QX7 receiver, so I'll show you how to bind it to a QX7. So this, this radio is already set up, and if you want to learn about how to set up a QX7, Joshua Barwell has a ton of videos on these radios. But I'm going to show you how to do a quick binding of this radio, and if you have this radio, you might already know how it works and how to set up the switches, but you'll definitely need to set up an arm switch, and I have this switch set up as my arm switch, switch on aux channel 1, which is channel 5 on an 8-channel transmitter. So in order to bind this receiver, we're going to need to push it out the back just a little bit so we can access this bind button. And it's a little bit tricky, but you need to push that button. You need to be holding this button when you plug in the battery. So having a friend around to help you with this might be helpful, because it's kind of hard to do by yourself. If you did that properly, you should have a green light, a red light, and a blue light on the RXSR receiver. And then we're going to go into the radio and into the bind settings. So on the radio, all right, we're going to press the middle button, we're going to page over to the next page, and we're going to scroll backwards all the way up to the external receiver. We're going to go to the external receiver, and we're going to click the bind button here. And we're going to click one more time. And if we did that correctly, we should see the red light flashing on the receiver. All right, and we're going to press this button one more time to exit bind mode, hit exit a couple times, and unplug and replug the battery. And if everything went properly, you should have a light green light and a blue light on without the red light. And that means that you are bound to the transmitter. I'm going to hold it really tight here and hit the arm switch. And we're working. So the last thing we have to do is add our battery strap. We've got this little piece of rubber material that comes with the Beta FPV frame, and we're going to install that on the bottom. Keeps the battery from sliding off in flight. It actually comes as two separate pieces, so you can peel them off one at a time. You want to figure out what kind of battery you're going to use and what orientation you want this to be in, and place it on the frame in a way that keeps the battery from sliding around. So I'm going to stick mine in that orientation, because I'm using these weird batteries that I just had happen to have laying around. So when I put my battery on, the plug will reach just fine. And then once I know what orientation my battery is going to be sitting in, I can run my battery strap through the frame 
very easily in order to strap the battery in place. Get our battery in there, strap her down, plug in the battery, and we're ready for our first flight. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this build video. I hope it was helpful and gave you a little bit of information on how to build this system. I'm Let's Fly RC. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>